Well, hello, ECF. How are you guys doing today? 
Good. Could you stand with us? Uh, we're going to start uh, our gathering, uh, and we're going to start hopefully in a position of worship. We gather together um, to make much of God and to glorify him for all the different aspects. And so as we start today's gathering, can we just put ourselves in a physical position uh, that allows us to be open to God? Because God made us holistically physical, mental, spiritual, all the above. And so let's take a moment of silence. Center our brains uh, and focus on the person we're actually worshiping. Because worship is actually a response to what God is and what he's doing. And so let's take a moment and just center ourselves on him. God, we thank you that you paid the price for us to be in relationship with you. And so as we lift our voices, as we use our minds to think about the different aspects of who you are and how you relate with us, God, we ask that our worship, our response to who you are would be pleasing to you, that as your children, as people who are following after you, that our hearts would be pure because you are drawing us in. It's in your son's name we approach you. Amen? Amen. Let's sing. you weary come all you thirsty come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open arms. God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom. For God so loved, God so loved the world. From whom all blessings flow Praise Him, praise Him For the wonders of His love Praise God, praise God From whom all blessings flow Oh, 
the cross, Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. How great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my How straight a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm Yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise the one that set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning Then came the morning That sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you are my living hope
resurrected from the grave, that when we follow in the pattern of your son, we have relationship with you. And so, Father, we thank you. And as we look to the cross tonight, we'd ask that the depth of your love would be understood by this church tonight. That would be called, pulled closer to you in relationship. It's in your son's name we approach you. We say we love you. Amen? Amen. All right. It's the best time where you're actually going to catch up with everyone that we've missed out on a week. So ask them. This is the question that the youth are going to ask you. Just heads up. It's, what is your favorite way to have eggs? It's a weird question, but what is your favorite way to have eggs? Turn to your neighbor, ask them.
Test, test, test. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome you back to your seats, if you can. Thank you. My name is Nicole. I am the office administrator at ECF. If I have not met you, hello. Um, if you are new or visiting with us, we do have connection cards out in the entry there or the back table. We would love to meet you. Um, give us a little information. We can send you a welcome email and say hello. Um, as always, you can find all details and information in your bulletin. That is also on the table there on your ECF app website or just come chase one of us with one of these name tags down and we'll give you all the information that we know, <laughs> right? Um, just a couple brief announcements for you. Um, next Sunday is a parents meeting. Um, if you have kids from birth all the way through youth, we would love for you at to attend that. It's right after service, about 6.45, 6.50ish. We will have childcare and food for you. So if you could RSVP to that so we can have enough food and childcare for you, that would be great. Monday, no school. So day of fun for your kids. Um, more details, there's also little postcards out there for you. Um, more details on that, but pretty much from 9.30 to 3.30, they get to bounce, they get to eat, they get to watch movies, and you get a free day, right? <laughs> so um, go ahead and RSVP to that. Uh, register for that, registration is open. Um, last but not least, we have these cute little wooden plaques that I'm going to hand out to you after service. And we've named this, I have to do hand motions. If you know me, I have to talk with my hands. So it's the board of excitement. Okay, not, we're, we're not bored of excitement. We want to fill and create a board of excitement. So these are for you to take home. Write what you are excited for or can't wait for, for the new building. So, and then we're gonna do something fabulous with them, okay? Got it? So come see me after service. All right. I'm going to invite Joseph up to the stage. Thanks. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. You probably got that last week as you fellowshiped together. We were celebrating Christmas and the New Year's with the flu and binge watching like Netflix baking shows and you know, all of that kind of fun stuff. So um, you're welcome. I did not come and share it with all of you last week. Rather, we stayed at home for a lot of days in a row with fires and the television on far, far more than we ever have the TV on in our home. It was kind of discouraging, but it's good to be on the other side of that. It's good to be back together um, with you, and we are so close to wrapping up Mark's gospel. If you are visiting with us or joining us for the first time, we have gone about a year to get through Mark's gospel account, and tonight we are going to talk about the crucifixion. And so, if you're joining us or visiting with us, um, you get maybe the, one of the most important components of what we believe here, but kind of weird for your first Sunday to talk about the crucifixion. And yet, we're a group of people who believe that we have a Savior, God's Son, who was crucified and raised from the dead. And if that's not weird, then let's just talk about the crucifixion um, today. But that's what we believe, and we believe that with all of our heart. And we believe that that's what gives us life. And so before jumping in and reading um, Mark 15, I do want to just make one other quick announcement that I believe has been in bulletins and stuff. Linda Gall, I spoke with her this afternoon, is offering a class here on Thursday, January 19th at 6.30 p.m. And it's the Living by Design Seminar. And it's really just an exploration of God's design for work, in God's good design for work. So if you are in career transitions, if you are younger and maybe looking to launch a career, or if you just are interested in learning about what it means that God designed work as a good thing, as part of his plan, I would encourage you to come and join. January 19th, 6.30 p.m., there are flyers in the back with QR codes that will take you to Linda's website where you can register and all of that, and come and talk to the staff if you have any other questions. Um, one quick kind of warning before jumping in and reading Mark 15 this evening. As I look around, I'm, I don't see any kids in here, but I'm gonna get a little detailed as we talk about the crucifixion. 
I think it's necessary. And so if there are younger kids in here, I'm going to be very professional and appropriate, but we're going to talk about the crucifixion, which can be a pretty heavy thing. So I just want to, I just want to kind of give that warning and throw it out there. So Mark 15, can we stand together? I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to do my best to get through it without coughing once. Um, Mark chapter 15. I'm reading from the ESV, verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison, who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Verse 16, and the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, hail, king of the Jews, and they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him, and dividing his garments among them, cast lots for them to decide which each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Verse 33, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it, said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on, it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. And when, he had, and when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening came, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. 
Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked whether he had already, was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We acknowledge how your word in one second can both bring a level of deep sorrow and sadness and pain and yet simultaneously bring rejoicing. And so this evening, we ask that you would help us to get wisdom from your word, that we would acknowledge the truth of the crucifixion and understand what this means for us. We ask and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. So let me start with asking a question. How many of you at various times in your life have asked a question similar to, is this a a circumstance, an experience, something that's happening in your life? Is this God or is it man? Is this thing that I'm experiencing God's doing or is it simply just life? You know, I've shared with some of you that we had this like season of seemingly like everything going wrong with <laughs> broken toilets and um, you know kitchen problems and all kinds of stuff. And, and and here's why it matters. I remember sitting telling Haley one night, I wish I would just be able to know: is this God trying to teach me something, or is this just? life happening. And here's why it matters. At least here's why it felt like it mattered in the moment. I wanted to be able to say, what am I supposed to get out of this? What am I supposed to learn? How do I need to change? Or I wanted to be able to just say, sometimes life's not fun. Things go wrong. And there's nothing to learn. It's just life. And it's hard. And so today when we come to scripture, when we approach this story of the crucifixion, this really is a question that I want to wrestle with a little bit today. Is it God or is it life? I mean, mean, is God responsible for the death and the crucifixion of Jesus? Or did things just go south for a guy from Nazareth who lived for 30 plus years and walked around for a few years with a team of disciples. He just made enough people mad that people in power and authority took it in their own hands and crucified him. Because that question matters when we think about scripture. It matters more so than is a broken toilet God trying to teach me something or is it just life and it's time to replace a toilet. And so today we're gonna do two things. We're going to ask two questions, and the first question is this. What killed Jesus? Seems like a pretty simple question, but we're going to ask the question, what killed Jesus? And the second question we're going to ask is, what did the crucifixion accomplish? So what killed Jesus, and what did the crucifixion accomplish? And tonight, rather than kind of working my way through the passage, like I often do, we're going to kind of step back and look at this from like a little bit bigger level. And so first, what killed Jesus? And you may think this is a super obvious question. I mean, as I asked that, some of your minds probably said, the crucifixion killed Jesus. Duh. I mean, it killed a lot of people, and Jesus was one of them. So that's what killed Jesus. Can't believe I'm sitting here tonight with a pastor who's asking the question, what killed Jesus? It was the crucifixion. But let's dive a bit deeper into gaining understanding of how crucifixion worked. It's generally believed that the Persians first began crucifying criminals sometime between 3 and 500 BC. Eventually, the Romans perfected this type of execution, which is considered today by most to be the most horrendous form of capital punishment 
to ever exist. You see, in addition to the physical pain and suffering that a victim would experience, crucifixion was designed to bring deep shame and embarrassment to the victim with the goal of essentially completely stripping away every last sense of humanity that the victim had. Remember, individuals condemned to persecution were often tortured for long periods of time leading up to the execution itself. So prior to hanging on a cross, they were tortured, and we're going to see that in Jesus here in just a minute. Victims of crucifixion were spat on, they were mocked, they were often scourged and flogged, made into public spectacles, and ultimately nailed completely or almost completely naked with their midsection immediately at the eye of the onlooker. Can you imagine the shame and humiliation? So not only was crucifixion painfully torturous, it was also excruciatingly inhumane in every single way. I know this next question sounds rather grotesque, but I'm going to ask it anyways because it's helping me build to a point. How did crucifixion kill someone? Literally, how did it, how did it lead to death? In just a minute, we're going to come back and we're going to walk through the details of what we know from Jesus' crucifixion. But let me answer the question as succinctly as possible. Here's how crucifixion worked. The majority of crucifixion victims would almost certainly have experienced either cardiac arrest or a coma while hanging on the cross, which would have resulted in an inability to lift oneself up off the cross to exhale. And ultimately, they would have died from asphyxiation. In other words, they would have suffocated to death from lack of oxygen, literally not having the strength to pull themselves up to breathe. Now, now that you understand that, let's walk through what we know about Jesus' crucifixion account. Again, I know these details can be hard to bear, but I believe we need to understand this to fully appreciate what Scripture teaches us about the person of Jesus. So you'll remember in Mark chapter 14, a few weeks ago, we read the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, Jesus is... Is, is seemingly almost tortured with just the pain and the agony of what he knows is coming. And he cries out, Father, take this cup from me. But then what does he say? But your will, not mine. Remember, he's crying out, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to move forward. Is there plan B? But if this is your will, I will be obedient. And in Luke's account of of this moment in Jesus' life, we read this in Luke 22, 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And we read this and we think, like, that's weird. So, like, he was sweating blood. And, And there's quite a few different perspectives on this, but... Most people actually say, yeah, he was sweating blood. There's this condition called hemothidrosis, which is the result of intense physical, mental, psychological exertion that causes tremendous stress and agony, which results in sweating blood. And there's like real medical journals documenting not a lot of occasions, but occasions where this has happened to people. And so this is what Jesus was experiencing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Such pain and stress and anguish for both the exertion that has gotten him to that point, but also the knowledge of what is to come, that he starts to sweat blood. And so before the actual events of the crucifixion, we know that Jesus is completely and utterly exhausted as a human being. Not to mention the challenge that comes from knowing that literally every single person who's been with you for the last three years has abandoned you. That's the state at which Jesus arrives to crucifixion. And so in Mark 15, what did we read tonight? Jesus is delivered over to Pilate. He's questioned in the courts. 
when given the opportunity to, to release Jesus or Barabbas, Jesus' own people, the Jews, are crying out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And Pilate like, but the guy hasn't done anything wrong. What should I do with him? Crucify him, crucify him. So he's here with this anguish, just the day before likely having sweat blood from the stress. Here is in front of the crowd who's yelling, crucify him, crucify him. We're told that Jesus is mocked. They put a purple cloak on him as a joke to mock him. Ooh, Jesus, king of the Jews. Purple was a sign of, of wealth and success and prosperity. And so they throw a purple cloak on him like, oh yeah, you're the king who's about to be crucified. They spat on him, placed a crown of thorns on his head, hit the crown of thorns with a reed, driving the thorns into his skull. They shouted, hail, king of the Jews. And we're told in Mark 15 that they bowed down to Jesus in mockery. King of the Jews, king of the Jews. This is not worship. This is mockery. We learn from John's gospel in chapter 19 that Jesus was scourged. Scourged, scourged, I think it's pronounced both ways. Here's what that was. Two Romans, like imagine NFL football linebackers, with 18-inch wooden handles, and out of these 18-inch wooden handles, nine six- to seven-foot strips of leather. And at the end of each strip of leather was a lead weight. Imagine like a massive fishing weight that you'd use when you're going deep sea fishing. And attached to that lead weight, the bones from sheep and cows. Jesus was led over as was customary for someone who was scourged, his hands tied up in front of him, a Roman at each side, 39 lashes as they came from each side, one after the other after the other, from shoulder down to ankle. I listened this last week to a, a medical professional who does not profess Christianity, who says, I believe in these actual events. And those 39 blows would have delivered up to 2,000 stitches to be able to heal, heal them, to be able to close up those wounds. Because what happens is you get hit in the back, the bone digs into your flesh, grabs onto muscle, and pulls it out through your flesh. 39 times, and each lashing could have driven into his skin in nine different places. Painful. So why didn't Jesus bleed to death? That's the question. Why didn't he bleed to death? I mean, he was just scourged, so he, sh he certainly should have bled to death. Well, we know that Romans would scourge people at night in the cold air. Why? What happens in cold air? Our blood clots much quicker to continue the pain and the suffering so that they wouldn't bleed to death so that they would be crucified in the heat of the day where birds would come down and pick at their flesh and experience crucifixion in the heat of the day. So Jesus, in the cool night air, endured scourging, designed not to kill, but to keep someone alive in painful agony, awaiting the torturous crucifixion the coming day. So consider this state that Jesus was in before he was even crucified. Then the Gospels tell us that Jesus carried his own cross. Think of like a um, railroad tie, 125, 150 pounds. He carried it for a portion of the way before he was no longer able to do so. Most researchers say a third of a mile carrying 125, 150 pound railroad tie sliding up and down his back that was just scourged the night before. He got to the point where he was no longer physically able to carry the cross, so Simon of Cyrene was told to carry it the remainder of the way to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And it was there that Jesus was crucified with a sign that read, King of the Jews above the cross. You see, when people were crucified, 
what they were being condemned for was to be put on a cross hanging above them so that everyone could mock them for the horrible criminal that they were. And so we know that Jesus was being crucified for being the king of the Jews, not for a crime he had committed, but for who he was. So each gospel account details the crucifixion slightly different. But here's what we know. Nails were driven through his hands, but the Greek word for hands here includes the wrist. And it certainly wasn't through the hands because nobody could hang from that. They would just fall down. It would rip the flesh right off. And so the Romans perfected a way to drive six to nine inch nails through the two bones in the hand that would pierce not veins or anything like that because lest they bleed to death but would pierce parts of your body that would increase the pain, increase the pain. Nails through his wrist, propped up, nails through his feet. And here's the challenge of crucifixion, breathing. You see, hanging from the cross, it was easy to take a breath in because as we breathe, our diaphragms drop The breathing out was the hard part. To exhale in order to be able to take a next breath in, someone who is crucified would literally have to put pressure on their feet and on their wrists, hanging by a nail, to pull themselves up, to exhale, and then they would fall back down. Inhale, pull themselves up, exhale. Every single breath, pulling yourself up. And yet, while Jesus hung on the cross, he was not only able to maintain a sufficient level of breath for some period of time, he was also able to speak. In the four gospel accounts, we have seven recorded statements. I'm going to read five of them for you right here. In Luke, we see Jesus say, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise, as he speaks to one of the criminals next to him. In John, Jesus looks down and says, Woman, behold, your son. He looks at his disciple, behold, your mother. John also documents Jesus saying, I thirst. I'm thirsty from the cross. Matthew and Mark both document Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in John, at the very end, as Jesus has hung for hours, enduring the crucifixion, he says, it is finished. It is finished. And so while some people say that Jesus died from cardiac arrest or from shock or a mental breakdown, we need to understand why those weren't the case. Cardiac arrest would almost certainly have led to unconsciousness. There's nothing in the four Gospels that suggests that Jesus was ever unconscious while he was on the cross. Quite the opposite. He's saying some relatively coherent things from the cross as he's crucified. He likely didn't die from shock or mental breakdown or else we wouldn't have coherent statements from him on the cross. Would we have had a Roman centurion say, surely this man is the son of God if he just had some mental breakdown on the cross? And so again, we must ask ourselves, what killed Jesus? We learn something very important in John's account in chapter 19. John writes this, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So in order to protect the Sabbath on the coming day, the Jews went to Pilate and say, break their legs so we can get them down and we don't have to do this on the Sabbath. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, than of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, we read this and we just gloss over it, but this is really meaningful, and here's why. It was customary, if you needed to get someone down from the cross, that you would snap both of their legs, and here's why. They could no longer pick themselves up to breathe. So within moments of of breaking someone's legs on the cross, they'd be dead. 
because they couldn't breathe anymore. And yet they get to Jesus and they say, we don't need to do it. We don't need to break his legs. He's already dead. Jesus had already died. And so finally, for the last time, what killed Jesus? I intentionally skipped two of Jesus' sayings from the cross. We find one of them in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. It says this, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So in today's brief introduction, I asked how many of us have asked the question, is this God doing something in my life or is this just life? So we get to that question here as we consider what killed Jesus in the crucifixion. Was this just a bunch of angry men who angered a mob to kill Jesus, or is there something greater going on? Is God's sovereignty playing out in a way here that honestly stuns us and shocks us, and yet we have to look to the text to answer these questions? And so did God do it, or did man do it? Who killed Jesus? What's responsible for his death? And I would say, well, yes and yes. But if man only was responsible for Jesus' death without Jesus voluntarily giving up his spirit, one could argue that his death was rather meaningless. Honestly. I mean, we have accounts of thousands of people being crucified We have accounts of literally like 2,000 people on one day being crucified, leading out of the city as a reminder, don't mess with us. Did those deaths mean anything? I mean, sure, of course they meant something. These are human beings. But did they mean anything in terms of the eternal spiritual significance? However, if the cause of Jesus' death was God himself, fully incarnate, surrendering to the will of the Father by giving up his own spirit, then there must be a purpose. I mean, what other explanation do we have for Jesus saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit? We know he didn't die in the exact same way that the vast majority of criminals who were crucified died because they came to break the other two legs and Jesus was already gone. Why? Because he had already surrendered his spirit. It is finished. I commit my spirit. And so the question then becomes, what's the purpose? If part or a significant aspect of Jesus' death is not the crucifixion and was him willfully surrendering his spirit, then there must be a greater purpose that we have to ask. And if you grew up in church like I did, then here's what you're usually told. Okay, most of us see like Uh, How great the chasm. We sang this in a song tonight. We see like this valley or this chasm or this big trench. And on one side is us, me and you. On the other side is Jesus. We see the picture of the cross that like falls over the chasm. And we're told, here's the point of the crucifixion of Jesus. You're stuck here. God's over here. Your sin can't get you to the other side. But the cross falls down. You can walk across the cross and get to the other side. And that's how salvation works. And while there's truth in that, And that's important truth, that that the crucifixion is what draws us into relationship with Jesus. Uh, I want to consider some other things. I want to think about some other things that the crucifixion accomplished. And here's the truth. We could do like two months of sermons on this. We could go through the New Testament after the Gospels and look at like 30 or 40 or 50 things that the cross accomplished. But We're just going to go through a handful of them quickly tonight. And here's why. Because if God's plan was the cross and Jesus willfully surrendered his spirit, 
don't we want to live out of what that accomplished? Don't we want to live in such a way that lives in light of that? I mean, I do. If it's, if it's real, then I want to take full advantage of what that accomplishes. So let me go through a few things that, that the cross accomplishes. First, it accomplishes freedom from sin. This is different than salvation. We're told in Romans 6, 5 and 6, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And so one of the things that the crucifixion accomplishes is freedom from sin. Now, hear me say this. This doesn't promise that you will never sin again. So please don't expect that, or you're going to be very disappointed about five minutes after service when you walk out and say something disrespectful to someone else or stub your toe and, you know, something comes out of your mouth. But here's what this does promise us, that we are no longer enslaved and living in bondage to sin. And friends, that is really good news. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you struggle consistently with the same sin? Like over and over and over again. Cameron, thanks for raising your hand. That's why you're sitting in the front row tonight. I mean, I think we all know what I'm talking about. Like, again, are you serious? I can't overcome this. I can't. Well, the Bible tells us that we have freedom from that kind of slavery. From that kind of slavery. And so that's good news. And so for those of us who feel stuck in a way of sin, the Bible tells us that the cross and the crucifixion gives you a way out of that slavery. And how does it do that? The next thing that the cross accomplishes is our redemption. We're told in 1 Peter 1, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And then it continues on to talk about the precious blood of Christ. Okay, we weren't redeemed with physical things. We weren't purchased with silver and gold. I I mean, think of how fun it is to redeem like a coupon, okay? Maybe I'm the only one, but I was going to get coffee on my way here and I ended up not getting coffee. Someone gave me a free coffee drink and I showed up and there's like 150 cars in the line before me and it was so disappointing that I didn't get to redeem my free coffee on my way to church. But I mean, it's fun to be able to say like, free this, free that, 50% off, buy one, get one free. And that's not the redemption that Christ bought for us. With his precious blood, we were fully redeemed in relationship with him. And that is what gets us freedom from sin. Okay? So we were, the cross accomplished freedom of sin. The cross accomplished redemption. The cross accomplished third new life. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so when we profess faith, when we submit and surrender to Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are told we've been given new life, that our life no longer is simply ours to live, but it's Christ's life being lived through us. So we've been given freedom from sin. We've been, we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We've been given new life. Fourthly, we've been reconciled, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and through 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Wow, it's not just that we stand on one side of the chasm and march across, across to to get to God, but it's that actually what accomplishes 
that what accomplished by the cross is reconciliation, that we have been redeemed and reconciled in new relationship with God. And it doesn't stop there. We have been given the ministry of continual reconciliation. Because, friends, we need to be reconciled to God every day. I mean, I, I said the sinner's prayer, and then I woke up, and I wasn't perfect. <laughs> And I still struggled to be in relationship with God. I still s- struggled to be excited about following him. I still struggled to do the things that he's called me to do about being generous and praying and all of those. Like, I still struggled. Why? Because I need to be reconciled, like, a lot. <laughs> a lot. But thankfully, he's given us that ministry as well. Not just to be reconciled with God, but to reconcile with others. Two more, okay? Fifthly, the cross accomplishes healing. Wow. This is, we need this. Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. And I think Isaiah here the voice of the Lord was primarily talking about a a spiritual healing that draws us into relationship with him. But the Psalms and the prophets are literally chocked full of talking about emotional, psychological, physical, like other forms of healing that God in his sovereignty has the power to offer us. Not in a weird kind of way of like, well, my foot hurts a little bit this morning, and so I'm like, all I have to do is kind of like rub something and say a prayer, and then voila, not magic, but the power of God, like healing through the cross. And lastly, at least for today, the cross defeats the power of evil and darkness. And friends, I know in 2023, talking about evil and darkness is not very cool. (laughs) Like, we want to be able to explain everything with science and reason and rational thinking and logic. And I get that. I'm an engineer. I like science. I like logic. If, If you talk to Haley, she'd probably say I'm, like, too logical and rational all the time. And so I struggle with this faith component. I struggle, honestly, to see this other realm of darkness and evil. It's a hard thing for me to do. But I have to submit to the truth of God's word if I'm going to say it's truth. And Colossians 2 gives insight to this. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and principalities and put them to shame by triumphing over them. And so, friends, there does exist this realm of darkness and evil. It's real, even though it's hard to understand, I struggle to understand it, but as much as I've tried, I can't logically explain everything in this world. And yet, one of the things that the cross accomplishes is defeating those powers in the world that we live in today. Defeating them in the sense of they never exist, I'm pretty sure evil and darkness is still very alive and well in this world. But for me and you, They have no reign over our lives. They have no authority when we walk in the power of the cross. And so tonight, what killed Jesus? Well, yes, the crucifixion in a way did kill Jesus. But what did we get insight into tonight? That Jesus surrendered his will obediently and by his own doing. He gave up. Not in a way of like, I can't win this, in a way of, I give up out of submission to the Father's ultimate plan. And what did the crucifixion accomplish? Well, it accomplished a lot, but we just talked about a few things. Freedom from sin, redemption, new life, reconciliation, healing, defeating the power of evil and darkness. 
And so in conclusion, as I invite the band to come back up and join me on stage here, I intentionally left out one of Jesus' sayings from the cross. I told you there were seven of them. I read the first five of them immediately. I read the sixth one where he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, but I intentionally left one out. It was one of the first that he said from the cross, most likely the very first. Anyone catch it? Anyone remember what that seventh saying was? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as we approach a time of communion like we do every week here, I want to say something with some boldness and conviction. I don't like when people just pull scripture out of context and quote it like it's Jesus' words to us today. Like when we're going through a bad time. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you. Like I get it. I, I do get it. It tells us something about God's character, which hopefully encourages us. But but Jeremiah 29, 11 was not written from God to Joseph, like in 2023. It tells me a lot about his character. That does help me. But those aren't words from God to me. And so these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Those, those were Jesus' words on the cross in a specific context in a place and time speaking about a specific group of people. And yet... And yet, when we read the rest of the New Testament, here's what we know to be true. That Jesus looks at us the same way. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I'll tell you what, as as I come to communion this evening, I am desperate for that forgiveness because my sin, knowingly and sometimes accidentally, though it's probably not as accidentally as I tell myself it is, my sin and my flesh get in the way. And so I need a savior to say, Father, forgive Joseph, for he knows not what he does. And so this evening, as the band leads us in how deep the Father's love for us I want to just let you take communion when you feel ready. And I say this most weeks, but we believe here that anyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus can participate in communion, but this is something reserved for people who have put their genuine faith in Jesus. And so if you're here tonight and have not done that, I would say just let the time pass. Reflect on my words. Reflect on where your heart is. Reflect on what you actually think about Jesus. But here's how I want to encourage you. When you're ready, as you take communion, maybe alone or maybe with those sitting next to you, what do you need the crucifixion to accomplish in your life tonight? Do you need freedom from sin? Do you need redemption? Do you need new life? Do you need reconciliation? Do you need healing? Do you need Jesus to defeat the power of evil and darkness in your life? I mean, if you're like me, you read all of those and you say yes and yes and yes and yes. But that's a lot for our mind to think about. So think about one. Choose one. What do you need the cross to accomplish in your life tonight? The band will lead us in how deep the Father's love for us as they remind us of the goodness of how much God loved us.
should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turned to Mother chosen one Bring many sons to glory Join me in prayer. Father, by this we know his wounds have paid our ransom. And Father, we know that the crucifixion has accomplished so much more than simply paying our ransom. And yet, 
we want to acknowledge that we are thankful. We are grateful that you sent your son to bear the weight of our sin, to pay a ransom that we could never afford. We thank you for new life, for redemption, for reconciliation, for conquering the power of evil and darkness. We thank you that the cross does so much. And so in response, we say collectively, God, give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the patience, give us the perseverance, give us what we need tonight and tomorrow and the next day to live in light of the reality of the crucifixion. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, friends, one more thing that we're going to do this evening, kind of a little announcement and piece of family business for the church. I'm going to invite John and Deb and um, Todd and Susan to join me up here for just a minute. Um, and don't get worried. Like I, I felt like I just sucked the breath out of the room, right? <laughs> okay, why, why are these people coming up on stage here? You can make your way this way a little bit just to make sure we're all in the, the live stream. Um, so most of you know these uh, two amazing couples. Um, and most of you know that Todd and John are two of the elders of the church. And so um, a quick announcement and then some explanation. The announcement is this, that effective this week, both Todd and John are stepping aside from the eldership. So effective um, immediately. But, but here's what I want to say. John, I mean, it's been like 20, I mean, since that, a, lot. a lot, more than 20 years. John has served and Deb has so graciously um, let him just leave for hours on end to serve this body for over 20 years. John, yes, that's worth a round of applause. The plan was for John to um, end his time with the eldership several years ago, and then things like COVID and a new lead pastor and a building purchase and all of these things came up, and so the eldership went to John and like, John, we need your experience here. And so he so graciously gave multiple years, more than he had planned. Um, Todd has been serving for over eight years now. And I could say very similar things about the way that Todd and Susan have so graciously been just consistently committed. We had an elder, yes, again, thank you. We had an elder meeting this morning, and I was thinking Todd wasn't going to be there. And he was like the first one who showed up. And I'm thinking, Todd, thanks for being here. He was, you know, taking it to the very end. So we appreciate that. Um, and so these, these men and their wives have done a phenomenal job. The reason that they're transitioning now is we have gotten through a lot, a lot these last few years. And we feel like as we approach the entrance to the building and this next chapter that we as a leadership team, that we as a group of elders are in a really good and a really healthy place. And so it feels like the right time to say, guys, Susan, Deb, thank you so much. And we will lovingly and graciously let you transition out of this role. They're not going anywhere. John's remaining on the finance team. Susan and Todd will remain committed to this church. Deb gives countless hours back with it. So, so if you have questions, feel free, please, to come and speak with them. This isn't goodbye. This is, we are so grateful for your season as an elder, and now it's time for you to transition on. So one last announcement, and then I'll ask if you guys want to say anything. Um, our bylaws state that an elder term is between three and five years. This group of elders has already passed our three-year point, and this team has been through a lot. Like I said, COVID, lead pastor transition, purchasing a building, all of the stuff that comes along with this. And this team really wants to see us through this next chapter, so, so we don't anticipate any other changes. And yet, as we move toward the end of this year or early next year, and we are established in the building, we've found our new ministry rhythms and routines, it will be time for our bylaws to state to bring another slate of elders to the church for a vote of approval. And so we'll see 
likely some of the same elders. We want to encourage those of you who would consider eldership. God's word through the Apostle Paul tells us that the person who, can, who desires to be an elder desires a noble thing. Not because it's glamorous, but because you're serving God's church. And so to the current elders, thank you as well for serving our church so well in this season. We look forward to continuing to serve together, but we also look forward to the opportunity that our bylaws state of a transition to the next slate, to the next group of elders. Sometime late this year or early next year, there's not a date set. We want to do a really good job of leading in this next season of transition. So Todd, John, Susan, Deb, anything anyone wants to say? I want to at least give you space to do that. It's always dangerous to give me the microphone. Yeah. Um, 2023 budget, anybody? 2023 <laughs> budget, yeah. I'll, I'll be up here again very shortly, so don't <laughs> worry. Um, no, I, guys, I guess I would simply say this. This body of believers has been immensely easy to be in service to. So I... I had the opportunity to start serving with this body of believers in a leadership capacity before we even installed elders. And if you think about the path that this church has traveled, um, there's, a, there's a lot of history in the last 20 plus years. Um, some really, really good years, some challenging times, but you as a body of believers has been an honor and a privilege mm. to serve. And so thank you. You have made doing what Todd and I do, and I, th I think I speak for Todd very easily in this regard. You've made what we do a joy, a challenge, <laughs> but a joy nonetheless. You are a group of people that has been immensely sacrificial, um, immensely devoted to what God has called us to do on the east side. So thank you very much, Todd. Yeah, I would just echo that, that it has been, you know, there's a lot of issues that elders could deal with from doctrinal issues to, you know, church discipline. And by the grace of God, we have not had to hit any of those things, even though we went through COVID and everything else. That was a challenge in and of itself. But there's a lot of worse things that could have gone on. And you guys are just awesome. Really appreciate your hearts to serve Jesus. One of the things that attracted us to this church when we first started coming over 10 years ago was the fact that when there was a call to do something, whether that was help a widow or, or help someone with moving or whatever it was, that this church came out, and not just came out, but came out in force. And I really feel like this body is the hands and the feet of Jesus, and it's such an honor and a pleasure to serve. Thank you. So friends, would you stand with me? I'm going to close us in a prayer, both for these two amazing couples and just for our week, and then we will conclude. Father, we thank you for the Jensens and the Adairs. We thank you for their consistent, never-ending, year-after-year sacrifice for your church. It can be so easy for us to view this as our church. We've given it a name. We come here each week. We you know, make decisions, and yet we acknowledge that the church belongs to you. It's not our design. It's not our creation. It's not our idea. It's yours. And so we thank you for these four individuals who have so graciously and so sacrificially served the church. We look forward to continuing to walk alongside of them. We pray that in the hours that they would have spent leading and sacrificing for this church, that they would find rest where rest is needed, that they would invest and families, and new grandchildren, and aging parents, and all of the things that you have called them to in this next season. May they feel loved and cared for as we continue to walk shoulder to shoulder as a body of believers for the sake of the gospel. Father, this week, would you give each one of us the strength to live in light of the knowledge of the crucifixion? We praise you for sacrificially giving your son, and Jesus, we thank you for willfully surrendering your spirit to the will of the Father. Help us to live in light of that this week as we go and serve the east side, as we go to seek to make disciples, to love everyone that we come in contact with. May we do this in the strength and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
friends, have an amazing, amazing week.